this webinar, Literature, Waiting and Isolation. Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and Endgame. I'm Paul Stewart. I'm Professor of Literature at the University of Nicosia and a specialist on Samuel Beckett's work. Now, the webinar should last about an hour. I'll be talking for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time to have some form of discussion. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, to write those down via the website or YouTube, and I'll try and pick up on those later. Now, this is aimed at people who don't necessarily know that much about Beckett, um, but are keen to maybe uh, be introduced to him, and also to use Beckett to think through our current situation. Now, Samuel Beckett, 1906 to 1989, was an Irish playwright, novelist and poet who many regard as one of the most important figures in 20th century literature. Now, today we're going to be focusing on his first uh, produced two plays, Waiting for Godot and Endgame, which were originally written in French and then translated into English by Becker himself. The emergence of Waiting for Godot in the early 1950s completely changed the course of Western theatre. And Beckett's influence is still very keenly felt today, not only in drama, but also in prose, contemporary art, popular culture, and even in video games, it can be argued. Now, I think these two plays, written over half a century ago, offer us ways of thinking about our current situation. They don't offer solutions or big messages or arguably any real consolation for what we're experiencing, but they do offer a manner of thinking through those experiences. It was famously said that in Waiting for Godot, nothing happens twice. It's a two-act play in which a fair bit actually does happen, but it's easily summarised. So, Vladimir and Estragon, on the left and right there, or Didi and Gogo, as they're known for short, are waiting for Godot and pass the time in a variety of ways. Halfway through Act 1, Pozzo at the back, and Lucky, master and servant, appear, interact with Didi and Gogo, Lucky has a huge manic speech there, and then they leave. A messenger boy comes along, tells the pair that Godot will not be coming that evening, but will be coming tomorrow. Now the second act, which is meant to be the following evening, follows exactly the same pattern. But this time, Pozzo is blind, and Lucky can no longer speak. And Didi and Gogo are left waiting for Godot, at the end of the play. Now, normally we wait for something. The very concept of waiting <clears throat> suggests an end point. We wait for the bus, for the lunch break, for the end of lockdown. But waiting for Godot, we have our two evenings where these two down and out friends, Vladimir and Estragon, are meant to be meeting a Mr. Godot at a vague time at this place, which is just a country road marked by a tree. They seem to have an appointment, which means they expect an end time for their waiting. When Godot arrives, then their waiting will be done. But of course, Godot never arrives, and their meeting is always put off until a tomorrow that never comes. So Didi and Gogo are caught in a situation whereby the end point of waiting the arrival of Godot, recedes into a future, whilst the waiting itself continues. As such, they're effectively waiting without end. And possibly it's the end of things that might give them meaning. Now, the famous ending of the play is a case in point. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. They do not move. We might see this as Didi and Gogo wishing to literally and figuratively move on and in temporal terms to move on into the future. But the play ends in stasis. They don't move. The audience in the theatre, they're going to leave their seats, wait for the bus or the metro to go home. But Didi and Gogo 
are left in a frozen attitude of waiting, which we've started all over again when the curtain opens up on the next performance. So for Didi and Gogo, an end point is not reached at all. And they're left waiting, little knowing why they are waiting, for what, or for whom. Now, ever since the play first appeared, there's been that question of who is Godot? Given the resemblance in name, God has been a popular option, although another popular option is a French cycle racer from the period. There's very little specified about the figure of Godot within the play, and Didi and Gogo have very little idea what he might actually look like. For a start, they mistake Pozzo for Godot when he first arrives with Lucky. They have to question the messenger boy to glean what they can about Godot, which basically amounts to he's got a white beard and keeps sheep and goats. So the play doesn't say who Godot is simply because Didi and Gogo don't have a clear idea of the man. Also, the play is unclear why Didi and Gogo need to meet Godot at all. What exactly did we ask him for? Were well, you not there? I can't have been listening. Oh, nothing very definite. A kind of prayer, precisely, a vague supplication. The terms here are vague, but the vocabulary of religion, prayer, supplication, that's certainly present, which gives ammunition to those wishing to see some sort of Christian resonance within the figure of Godot. But this is balanced by Didi and Gogo immediately placing Godot within a much more grounded context of business and the commercial world. And what did he reply? That he'd seen, that he couldn't promise anything, that he'd have to think it over in the quiet of his home, consult his family, his friends, his agents, his correspondence, his books, his bank account. So whether a business relation or one suggested for religion, Didi and Gogo are, are placed as supplicants, seeking some form of benefit, a favour even, from the, the figure in power, Godot. So religion or commerce, the structure of power remains the same. We should also note here, though, that the two of them aren't describing Godot as he actually is. They're even unsure about his name but as they imagine him to be. In effect, both the language of religion and the language of commerce are ways of getting a handle on Godot, attempts to put into language that which kind of slips through their fingers. And that's perhaps why the very question of who or what is Godot has held such a sway over so many people. Those audience members and critics who have tried to identify Godot are caught in the same logic as we see in the play itself. So Didi and Gogo try various frames of reference for Godot and yet fail to capture him in language. And that's replicated, supplemented and extended by those of us outside the play who try to bring Godot to book. Now, whilst we're looking at this section, it might be worthwhile pointing out some features of Beckett's style, which is massively influential. The rapid toing and froing of the dialogue is a typical Beckett trait, for example. We see this throughout the play as the back and forth of dialogue is also punctuated by pauses or silences. A little later then, to give you an example, whilst trying to get to grips with Goddard, another of Beckett's stylistic features comes to the fore. And this might be termed assertion and qualification. I'm asking you if we're tied. Tied? Tied. How do you mean tied? Down. But to whom? By whom? To your man. To Godot. Tied to Godot. What an idea. No question of it. For the moment. There's no question that the two of them are tied to Godot. But this is immediately qualified by for the moment. In Endgame, the following play, there's an even clearer example. The characters pray, but no response is forthcoming, leading to an outburst against an apparently 
non-existent God. The bastard, he doesn't exist. Not yet. And this is my top tip for students of Beckett's plays. Go to the library when we're allowed to go to libraries again. Find an old copy of the play. And if you're lucky, it will be heavily underlined and highlighted. Now, lines like Ham's here, the bastard who doesn't exist, will be highlighted precisely because they seem really significant. Ham declaring there is no God is exactly the sort of quote you want in your essay. But it's the next line of clause, not yet. That is the real stinger in the tail, a thought that qualifies, complicates that apparent certainty of Ham's outbursts and perhaps leads us into much darker but much more fruitful ways of looking at the play. By the way, this technique also works really well for Shakespeare. Anyway, back to Godot. So they seem to assert that they're in no sense tied to Godot or under some form of obligation but that for the moment, cast that into doubt. So they might not yet be tied to Godot, so theoretically, they have the freedom to abandon the whole business of waiting for him. But that freedom is only illusory. If Godot is the means by which they move on from one state to another, from waiting to post-waiting, then Didi and Gogo are bound within that logic. If Godot is the means by which waiting stops, then his absence is the means by which waiting must go on. And importantly, the desire to identify Godot, I think, distracts us from this really crucial facet about him. His function. Godot is the thing for which one waits. So what I'm suggesting and I think it's something we're all living through now to varying degrees, is the experience of pure waiting. As the thing for which we wait recedes further into the distance, you know, in our case, the, the return for normality, the end of lockdown, the, the salvation of a vaccine. As that recedes, then our daily lives revolve around waiting without any apparent end. So how then do we wait? with no end in sight. Now time, as you'll no doubt have noticed in your own lives, does odd things when you are suspended in a waiting mode. In many ways, Didi and Gogo are trying to find ways of passing the time while they wait for Godot, but as they point out, that time would have passed anyway. So it might be useful to consider our experience of time in two separate ways. Uh, clock or mechanical time and duration or how we experience time as slowing down or speeding up. In the play, the experience of time, the sense of duration, seems to have completely overwhelmed mechanical time. For example, in between Act 1 and 2, the tree undergoes a radical change. The, the one thing on stage is a, is a tree. In Act 1, it's bare, no leaves. In Act 2, it sprouted a few leaves. Now, normally, of course, this would have happened over a number of days at the start of spring. But in the play, it seems to happen overnight. So if we were to take mechanical time as our measure, then there should have been a passage of a number of days. But Didi is convinced that only yesterday the tree had been bare. Yesterday has begun to mean very little indeed. But yesterday evening it was all black and bare. And now it's covered in leaves. Leaves. In a single night. Must be spring. But in a single night. I tell you we weren't here yesterday. Another of your nightmares. And where were we yesterday evening according to you? How do I know? In another compartment, there's no lack of void. In Endgame, even the word yesterday has lost its meaning. Yesterday. What does that mean, yesterday? That means that bloody awful day long ago before this bloody awful day. I use the words you taught me 
If they don't mean anything anymore, teach me others or let me be silent. When Pozzo and Lucky in Waiting for Godot reappear in Act Two, they too serve to mark the time, but in an unexpected way. Pozzo is now blind. Remember, this is the following day. And Lucky can no longer speak. Naturally enough, <coughs> Vladimir wants to know when this change occurred. But this infuriates Pozzo. Have you not done tormenting me with your accursed time? It's abominable. When? When? One day. Is that not enough for you? One day like any other day. One day he went dumb. One day I went blind. One day we'll go deaf. One day we were born. One day we shall die. The same day, the same second. Is that not enough for you? They give birth astride stride of the grave. The light gleams an instant. Then it's night once more. So we get a sense here that time has collapsed. Not just for Didi and Gogo, who are waiting for Godot, but in a more general sense. And I think the experience of time has shortened and become irrelevant to a great degree because, as Pozzo suggests, the experience of suffering is a constant. As suffering is with us all the time, then time itself becomes a blur of suffering rather than a steady progression according to the clock, the days, the seasons, or even the years. Now, the experience of suffering is a key factor in the plays, and one which, coupled with the idea of waiting without end, leads Didi and Gogo to entertain the idea of getting out of the entire situation by hanging themselves from the sole tree on the set. Arguably, Didi and Gogo will be taking control of their situation and ending the pause in which they seem to live if they hang themselves. But Didi and Gogo don't hang themselves. Because if things go wrong, one of them will be left alone. The fear of being left alone is one which haunts the two friends, if friends they are. There's a sense with these two of an almost forced company, a kind of double act that cannot be really dissolved. So one reason why they need each other so badly is to aid in the business of waiting. Basically, they have nothing to do while they wait. So they indulge in what seem to be insignificant bouts of dialogue, of play acting, as when they hit upon the idea of abusing each other and then making up. That's the idea. Let's abuse each other. Vermin, abortion, morpion, sewer rat, curate, cretin, critic. Oh, now let's make up. Go, go, Didi, your hand, take it. Come to my arms, your arms, my breast. Off we go. How time flies when one has fun. So we notice here that two of them are engaged in performance, almost a ritual just for something to do. However, it's not just boredom they're keeping at bay with their little bouts of blathering, as Estragon terms it. They talk in order not to think. In the meantime, let us try and converse calmly since we are incapable of being silent. You're right, we're inexhaustible. We have that excuse. It's so we weren't here. We have our reasons. All the dead voices, they make a noise like wings, like leaves, like sand, like leaves. They all speak together, each one to itself. What do they say? They talk about their lives. To have lived was not enough for them. They have to talk about it. To be dead is not enough for them. It is not sufficient. The dialogue here is beautifully poised between speech and silence, as if the silence calls forth further rounds of speech. Now, ironically, they speak in order not to dwell in or on the silence, but the rhythm of their language always leads them back into that void as they hear and respond to all those dead voices that are themselves engaged in another round of language. Now, this relation between speech and silence is a major uh, theme in Beckett's novels that were written at approximately the same time as Godot, Malloy, 
Malone dies and the unnameable. It's a relation, in fact, that remains a striking and a driving force throughout Beckett's career, both uh, in drama and prose. Now, sadly, there's no time to go into the, the prose pieces, but they are full of considerations of solitude, company, isolation, and the role of literature. And I think that amounts to the most profound interrogations of those sort of issues that one is likely to find. Back to Gogo. So Didi and Gogo perform and speak in order that whatever is in the silence is kept at bay. A silence that threatens all the more because of their condition of waiting. And I think we do experience this. When the demands of normal life are suspended, as they are now, those things which one cares not to think about, death, ageing, illness, suffering, those are the things our thoughts turn to. In Godot, and I think in Beckett in general, it's the fact of suffering that can be heard murmuring in the background. It can also be heard in the ending <clears throat> of Lucky's speech. I've given you a section of it there. But the ending of the speech, you have this repeated phrase, the skull, the skull in Connemara. Connemara is an area of Ireland. Now, in the original French text, the place name is Normandy. <clears throat> the site of Beckett's experiences at a Red Cross hospital at the end of the Second World War. This is San Lo, where he was. Sorry that the clarity is not that great. So rather than return to Ireland uh, at the outbreak of World War II, Beckett stayed in France and even worked with the resistance. He went back briefly to Ireland at the end of the war, but then volunteered in an Irish Red Cross hospital in Normandy in order to return to France. So saint Lo, where the hospital was based, was almost completely destroyed by Allied bombing and had become, as Beckett put it, the capital of the ruins. But in the English version, the site is deliberately Irish. So we have two different points of reference, the French and the Irish, but the overall point is perhaps the same. To a Frenchman in 1953, Normandy would evoke these scenes of the devastation of war. Connemara brings with it Another man-made disaster, the Irish famine of the previous century. And the sketches and accounts from those from that period, you can see it's a scene depicted of, of ruins, incredible poverty and suffering, and the overarching theme of death. So throughout the play, this deeply unhappy fact of existence is repeatedly foregrounded, even in what seem like really inconsequential bits of dialogue. As here, when they're talking about the tree, what is it? I don't know, a willow? Where are the leaves? Must be dead. No more weeping. Uh, in, in colloquial English, the willow is known as a weeping willow. This is the way it falls. So only when the willow is dead, Will the suffering of existence end? And in the same vein, and in line with a long list of Beckett's characters, Didi and Gogo have a sense that existence itself might be the problem. Suppose we repented. Repented what? Oh, we wouldn't have to go into details. Our being born. This concept that one is guilty and so in need of repentance, by the mere fact of having been born, has a long tradition in Western thought. And I think Beckett picks it up most from St. Augustine, the, uh, the fourth century uh, uh, theologian, and the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. So Didi and Gogo fend off a sense of this inherent suffering of life, a sense that, that comes to them through the silence, and they do that by maintaining a dialogue of playing, albeit in a somewhat joyless sense. Now, given this situation and the profound sense of waiting that gives rise to it, one would hope that some form of compassion, even of solidarity, would have its place. That's what we're told on the news all the time, at least. True, Didi and Gogo do express 
a certain tenderness towards each other from time to time. However, the problem of humanity is amply demonstrated in the play by the surprising acts of violence and exertions of power it contains. Pozzo, of course, keeps his slave servant Lucky starved and at the end of a rope. And it's tempting to see Pozzo as the sole representative of an uncaring upper class which treats humanity as a mere tool. But I think the play's complaint is greater than that. Everyone in this play gets the opportunity to exert themselves in a violent fashion, or is at least reported to do so. So we are told by Pozzo that Lucky torments his master. And Vladimir and Estragon's sympathy veers from Lucky to Pozzo as a result. Lucky himself kicks Estragon violently while Estragon is trying to wipe away Lucky's tears. And Estragon later takes revenge by kicking and hurling abuse at the defenceless Lucky. Vladimir kicks a similarly defenceless Pozzo in the crotch. And the sheer nastiness of humanity is underlined when Pozzo and Lucky return in Act Two. Remember, Pozzo is now blind and Lucky is now dumb, and they fall to the earth and Pozzo cries out for help. His cries for pity, and that's the word he uses, are met with a deliberation about what to do from Didi and Gogo. We should ask him for the bone first. Then, if he refuses, we'll leave him there. You mean we have him at our mercy? Yes. And that we should subordinate our good officers to certain conditions. What? Well, that seems intelligent, all right. So the misfortune of the admittedly odious Pozzo is an occasion to gain advantage. The pitiable situation of someone is the chance to exert one's power over them. And still whilst Pozzo is prone on the ground, Estragon plays a little game in the hope of amusing himself. What would be amusing? To try other names, one after the other. It had passed the time, and we'd be bound to hit on the right one sooner or later. Abel, Abel, help! Got it in one. I begin to weary of this motif. Perhaps the other is called Cain. Cain, Cain, help! He's all humanity. One of Beckett's earliest uh, critics, Ruby Cohen, suggested that this all humanity was indicative of a deep form of essentialist humanism in Beckett. Everyone was bound to suffer and Beckett directs a pitying eye towards that. But I think the point is somehow different. Cain and Abel are, of course, the first murderer and the first murder victim in Christian mythology. So all humanity here suggests that we're all one or the other. And the action of the play suggests that given the chance, we are all as likely be the murderer as the victim. And a quick tour around Beckett's fiction during these years only further makes the point. In this period, Beckett developed his signature character, the tramp who lives on the margins of society, getting on as best he can, usually gradually losing his physical abilities and left with only the remnants of what seems to be quite a good education. Do not make the mistake though, that because these figures are pitiable, that they themselves feel any such pity. Mercio Camier kick a policeman to death. Malloy savagely, savagely beats a charcoal burner who's offering him a place to live. Moran murders a stranger who bears a strong resemblance to him. And the ending of Malloy's narrative in Malone dies, sorry, Malone's narrative in Malone's dies, sees a party of inmates at a lunatic asylum killed by an axe-wielding maniac and warder, Le Mule. So compassion is in short supply in Waiting for Godot and Brackett's prose of the period. As you can see there with the original production of the Théâtre de Babylon, that sense of beating lucky. Now, if it's not that much in evidence in Godot, it's even less in evidence in Endgame. In many ways, this play is bleaker than Godot, although it's still plenty of black humour to keep us going. So four characters are in a single room, 
some sort of unspecified disaster has occurred as, quote, outside of here, it's death. And the world has become corpsed, with zero to see from the two windows at the back of the stage. So we have four characters in a state of forced isolation. They can't go out, and their provisions of painkillers, food, bicycle wheels are running down. Time's not stopped as such, but there's a sense that everything is running towards an end. But it's an end, as in Godot, that is not reached during the play. So Ham is blind and cannot walk. That's him at the front. He's confined to a chair on wheels. He's the master and Clove just behind him is his servant. Now Clove has difficulty walking and cannot sit down. Ham's parents, Nag and Nell, are aged, have no legs, and live in two dustbins. Now, as we saw with Godot, time is once again almost a meaningless concept. There's a constant harking back to, to yesterday and the repetition of the concept of once. We were happy once. We were beautiful once. Yet in the words of Ham, something is taking its course. If they're waiting for anything, it's for the end. But that too seems to be off in some unspecified future. Indeed, the first words of the play from Clove perfectly capture this sense of an ending without ending actually arriving. Finished, it's finished, nearly finished, it must be nearly finished. And these are remarkable words to open a play. If the audience took this literally, seriously, then they'd be back out of the theatre in a matter of minutes. It sets the scene then not as one of action, but rather as an action of ending, a winding down that doesn't quite come to a stop. Now, as in Godot, there's a slight religious dimension to these words. It is finished, or in Latin, consummatum est, or supposedly the last words of Christ as he died on the cross. But seeing as we've been waiting 2020 years since that moment, and for the last days to actually arrive, we might wonder what finished means in that context. So throughout the play, there is a constant desire for things to end, yet doubt whether that time will actually come. Have you not had enough? Yes. Of what? Of this, this thing I always had, not you. Then there's no reason for it to change. So there's a sense that things need to change in order for the end to come. But because there is no change, then the end will never arrive. Instead, there'll be a slow winding down of possibilities, opportunities and resources. But I need to be a little bit clear here. There's a distinct difference, I think, between the end point of endgame and that of waiting for Godot. In Godot, it's hoped that waiting be put an end to by some sort of intervention. But Godot, if he ever comes, will start some new phase for Didi and Gogo. In Endgame, the end point is ending itself. So there is hope in both situations, but a different aim. Hope for a new, perhaps better situation in Godot. Hope in Endgame that everything will cease to be, that it will all be finished at last. Now this brings us to the wonderful ancient problem of Pandora's box. As you'll no doubt remember, when Pandora's box was opened, disease, war, chaos, misery were loosed onto the world. And the only thing left in the box was hope. Now ever since Hesiod, there's been an almost continual debate as to why hope was in the box with all the evils that it contained. Is hope an antidote to all those evils, the thing left in the box to give mankind comfort and to allow us to better endure the suffering because we hope that things will get better? Or is hope in Pandora's box because it is one of the evils of mankind, the same as war and disease and chaos which come out of the box? In this case, hope might even be the greatest of evils as it gives an illusion of things getting better whilst we continue with our daily suffering, a position that Nietzsche held very strongly. For better or worse, and I suspect Beckett thinks for the worse, 
Hope is the mechanism which keeps us going even when God owed does not arrive or when the true end fails to come yet again. For Clove and for many of Beckett's characters, the hope is that one day he will have been judged to have suffered enough. And yes, that is Harry Potter. And yes, he is playing Clove. Well, he would be playing Clove at the moment in the West End. I say to myself, sometimes, Clove, you must learn to suffer better than that if you want them to weary of punishing you one day. I say to myself, sometimes, Clove, you must be there better than that if you want them to let you go one day. What does Clove mean by being there better? It's an odd phrase. For Clove, it seems it's not simply a matter of being, but there seem to be gradations of being, as if you could decline the idea along, the, along good, better and best. But surely one either is or is not. Yet Clove obviously has a concept of being, which unsurprisingly perhaps contains several degrees of grey rather than a normal black and white. And admittedly, the concept to be better is perhaps a difficult one to grasp. Now, Ham similarly suffers from this feeling that to be means to be there, not here. And Clove responds to this with his characteristic sort of bathos. I was never there. Clove, what is it? I was never there. Lucky for you. Absent always. It all happened without me. I don't know what's happened. When asked by Clough if he believes in the life to come, Ham replies with some relish, you have to be said, mine was always that. I think it's my favourite line of the play, actually. So this absence, this, this lack of sufficiently being or an, in, an inadequacy of being, as felt by both Ham and Clough, is characterised by a deferral of being. One will be better there be better in the future. One day I'll be there, be there better and be there enough in all its suffering in order to end. But one day, like tomorrow, doesn't come. Now these are admittedly rather tricky philosophical issues about the nature of being. But the crux of the matter is, for whatever reason, Clov and Ham may not yet be in a state that allows them to end. Indeed, at the end of the play, Clove is preparing to go, but remains on stage. And the last word of the play is importantly, remain. So what keeps these four characters going on in their isolation whilst they wait and hope for an end? I'll leave you. No. What is there to keep me here? The dialogue. Now, on one level, this is similar to what we've seen in Godot. Keep the conversation going in order to not let the darkness of thought take over. But, of course, dialogue is also a technical theatrical term, the scripted conversations between characters. So there's a hint, then, that Clove and Ham going for them, going, uh, what keeps them going, sorry, is their obligation to the script of the play, the endgame itself. And they have no choice but to play this play to the end. Play is a key concept in this drama. When Ham awakes at the beginning, he declares me to play and launches into a hesitant speech. Play has multiple different meanings. First, the title Endgame points us towards chess and a situation in which uh, there are a few pieces left on the board and it's doubtful whether a winning strategy is possible. And more commonly, of course, we think of play as, as something we do at our leisure. Play football, play a game, play with kids. And of course, the word play is also a synonym for the drama itself. We go to the theatre to watch a play. And Beckett even has a drama called simply play. Further, an actor plays a role in the theatre. And we also speak of ham actors, actors who play their role poorly or they're over the top. And this certainly fits the self-conscious performance ham indulges in. 
as we see in his opening speech and in the narrative he keeps developing throughout the play. One of the ways that Ham keeps going is by telling a story, although he fears that he'll soon run out of things to keep that story going. I'll soon have finished my story unless I bring in other characters. But where would I find them? Where would I look for them? Although art, in the form of Han's narrative, might be seen to be a way of continuing, almost a consolation, it's not quite up to the job. And Ham repeatedly just wants the whole thing to be over. Nag, his father, tries to pass the time by telling a joke about God and the tailor. But it's a joke that's been said many times before and now fails to have the same impact. Yes, yes, it's the most comical thing in the world. And we laugh, we laugh with a will in the beginning. But it's always the same thing. Yes, it's like the funny story you've heard too often. We still find it funny, but we don't laugh anymore. With both the joke and Ham's narrative, these are means of passing the time, of relieving the tedium of isolation, but they no longer really work. Art, it seems, might have once been a consolation, but is now no consolation at all, just an empty ritual. Now, all this, I admit, is very bleak, although there are very, very funny moments in both Godot and Endgame. And Beckett spoke of the text's ability to, to claw at our senses and sensibilities. It is, in many respects, not entirely, but predominantly, a pitiless world. And you'll remember that pity was also in short supply in Godot. Except, perhaps, for the self-pity that Ham indulges in. Rather like Pozzo talking of his blindness, Ham predicts a day when Clov will also be suddenly sightless. You'll look at the wall a while and then you'll say, I'll close my eyes, perhaps have a little sleep. After that, I'll feel better. And you close them. And when you open them again, there'll be no more wall anymore. Infinite emptiness will be all around you. All the resurrected dead of all the ages wouldn't fill it. And there you'd be like a little grit in the middle of the step. Yes, one day you'll know what it is. You'll be like me, except you won't have anyone with you because you won't have had pity on anyone and because there won't be anyone left to have pity on. So paradoxically, then, it's the very absence of pity and compassion or relative absence that makes us aware of how desperately we need them. The world outside the room has been blighted by some sort of catastrophe, a pandemic or a result of human callousness as epitomized by Ham. And the world of isolation inside the room is marred by the four characters torturing each other, but also themselves. Compassion, so absent in Endgame, more especially between the relationship between Ham and Clov, Compassion might have helped. It may not have solved the situation, but it could have made time pass with a little more grace as an end is approached, if not finally reached. Now, if you'd like to contact me outside of the, uh, the webinar, that's my email. If you're interested in pursuing any uh, options in terms of language and literature, please get in touch uh, with the admissions department. Um, you can see those addresses there. So hopefully, as I stop sharing um, this slide, there will be some comments and we can start a little bit of a discussion in the 15 minutes remaining to us. Uh, let's, oh God, um, yeah. Yes, um, any comments? Let me ask, okay, nothing yet. And this is a part of waiting that I was expecting. <laughs> Uh, wait for comments in order to to be better. Um, please don't feel um, they have to be massively um, informed. If you know nothing about Beckett, if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to, to question anything I've said or or done, then I'd be very happy to to do that.
No. <laughs> this is going to get embarrassing now, isn't it? Okay, anything? Okay, let's give it a few minutes. Um, <laughs> the extempore then for a bit while I'm waiting for some comments to come. If there are any. Um, one thing I wanted to do but didn't get around to doing uh, with this is to think about, I hinted at it a bit, but it's something that's been bothering me not only as a Beckett scholar but as a writer of, of, of novels and poetry. Ah, we do have. Uh, let's take uh, Nicholas there. Um, I think Nietzsche had called Schopenhauer as the true moralist. Well, there is that, that, that sort of passing on of the of the um, uh, the buck, not the buck, the baton from Schopenhauer to uh, to Nietzsche. Um, Beckett's relationship with with Schopenhauer has, has been very uh, much um, dealt with over the years. He's a very recognised influence of, on Beckett. I tend to think. Um, that he, he agrees with Schopenhauer up until a point, and that point is the consolation um, of art. And then I think uh, Beckett rather diverges from, um, from that. Um, so, yes, yeah, Schopenhauer is incredibly important. Uh, and Beckett sort of flirts with um, some of the, the more Eastern mystical philosophies that Schopenhauer does as well. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're, um, I, I wouldn't argue that Beckett is a moralist. I think he's, he sees it as too problematic for that. Um, he might use those, those concepts, but I don't get a sense of real adherence to it. Um, that he's much more worried about those solutions that are proposed within a moral framework. Now we also have a question from Hannah from Oxford. Um, you mentioned that Beckett writes primarily, oh you can see it. Yeah he does write primarily prose before Godot. Um, the, the shift comes um, oddly. Um, he, he's just finished two novels, he's writing in French at the, at the, at the time, He's just finished two novels, uh, Malloy and Malone Dies, and he says that he makes a shift to theatre as, as a way of relaxing, a, a relaxation, before he then has another bash at writing novels and starts writing the unnameable. Um, and I think there is, a, there is a sense of that enjoyment coming through. But if you look at some of the, um, in particular, um, the novel Mercier and Camille, or Mercier and Camille, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, which is written at the same period but doesn't appear until the 1970s. Um, a lot of the way the dialogue uh, in that book, in that novel, uh, is patterned is very, very similar to the rhythms that we see in Godot. So his prose in, is in many ways already exploring some of those rhythms, I think. But I think one of the things that, um, that theatre allowed him to do, which, which the prose doesn't do or, or, or is not geared towards doing is, is that relation between people it, is that uh, contact between people which which theater is so you know extremely dependent upon although of course later on in his career he then starts to develop the notion of the solitary within theater as well but initially i think it's that um that that relaxation from this incredibly rigorous prose writing that he was indulging in at the time. Um, and they are fun. I mean, th there's a reason why Godot is, and Endgame now, um, is repeatedly put on. 
you know, one of the most popular plays of the past 60 years. Um, and there's a reason why, you know, uh, Endgame on in the West, or would be on in the West End now with Radcliffe and um, Cummings? Something like that. I forget his name. Um, and there's a reason why someone like Daniel Radcliffe wants to play in Beckett. It's like a, a calling card, you know. I've, I've graduated. I've become a proper actor. Um, I think, Hannah, you may have seen that production. Um, but I won't let you. Um, you don't have to respond to that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a weird shift. Of course, uh, the one thing I didn't mention, that it seems like Goddard comes out of nowhere, so I'm looking around at my bookcases to, to see. Of course, he writes a play at the same time, or just before Goddard, that, that has never been performed except um, one time illegally in Iran. Uh, it's called Eleftheria, freedom, um, the, the Greek word for freedom. And it's, it's very, very different to Godot, very different, but it's written almost at the same time as. Um, it's hugely difficult to stage, so you can see why people haven't attempted it. And it's not entirely successful. And it's almost like a bridge work between... Um, the prose and and Godot. He did try to write plays earlier as well. Um, there is, um, we have a scrap, a very brief excerpt from uh, a play he attempted to write about um, Dr. Samuel Johnson. It's a very, very funny little excerpt, but, but sort of gives up on that. And every now and again, the letters he says, I'll try to write a play, but doesn't really get around to it until he starts writing a left and Godot. Uh and yeah. Godot yeah. as a break, basically, as a break. Um, yeah. I'll do it for time. Oh, that was good. Um, I think what to, just to pick up again, again on, on, on what Hannah was so, uh, asking, this shift is a is is it? I mean, it might be part of that sort of um, coming to coming to grips with being in the world, being in society in some sort of way. Uh, I mean, writing novels is an incredibly solitary business, um, so there might have been the, those sort of impulses as well. Oh, that's interesting. Nash 3000. Do you think Endgame has elements of an Irish mentality of refusing English militarization when it comes to language? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by militarization. There is, I mean, one of the most famous, I mean, I quoted it, that, that section yesterday, um, um, I use the words you taught me. If they don't mean anything anymore, um, teach me others. There is that element. I, I, I've often thought of that in relationship to, to Caliban in The Tempest, uh, who says something pretty similar. You know, uh, you taught me language and my, uh, and my profit on it is that I can curse you. I, I'm paraphrasing hugely. So there is a, an element of... I don't think refusal is quite the word. It's it's more a question of of turning that language back onto um, um, back onto Ham, the power figure. Um, that's a really difficult explanation. That's a really dodgy explanation I've just put forward. Um, um, I mean, part of, part of Beckett's translation of his own work is, is to make, it, it's, it's a very unofficial form of English that he uses anyway. I mean, it's very, I mean, Godot and Endgame uh, are very Hiberno English in their inflections. So there is that definite sort of 
rootedness within within um, Irish idioms, Irish, uh, and and again in, in Irish place in in waiting for Godot. I just to I'll come back to this. I've just seen from Hannah that at the end of the production with Radcliffe, they had Ham turn and howl in what sounded like an instruction. You remain. Oh my God, that's a bit radical. Because usually it's it, it, it's talking to his either to his handkerchief that he drapes over his head or to himself. I've never ever heard of that. That's really quite something. To come back to um, Nash three thousand, um, I like the idea of of, of refusals, but there, there, there's a complete there's a complicity as well. Um, if you read Ham's narratives, and this is a very interesting sort of little detail that, that, that opens things up in a nice way. And if you're interested, uh, people like Fergal Whelan have um, have opened these areas up and, and others uh, based in Ireland. Um, one of the places mentioned is Cov. Uh, it's spelt off the top of my head. Oh, is it K-O-V-8? No, it's K-O-V in uh in a text and it, it's, it's the the port near the the, the place in endgame and people thought oh, it's just a made-up name and then people thought well maybe not and actually it turns it could well be a, ref, a reference to a port on the south of ireland um which its gaelic name is k-o-b-h and it was known as and i might get this one either queenstown or queens ferry and it was one of the places that was the major source of uh, the major departure points for emigrants leaving Ireland to go to the States. So that's a, and that, that sort of sense of depopulating somewhere might have a particularly Irish resonance as well. But what, what I think Beckett is very careful to do is include these specifics of an Irish context or an Irish register um, but not universalize them, but make them sort of paradigms um, in some sort of way. You've got to remember that the, the, the experience of Endgame, and again, just to, to get technical on this a little bit, if we look back at the, the drafts that Beckett went through as he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with Endgame, you again see him starting off with, with specifics there's references to the play being set in Normandy, and that gradually gets worked out. Uh, it gets pushed away. So again, he's thinking in those sort of terms of um, um, the devastations of the war, and yet, as you saw in Godot and what I said, that 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 connects that that paradigm connects with the devastations of the Irish famine um, in the skulls, the skulls of Connemara. So it's, it's, it's an elusive work, elusive and allusive at the same time. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, um, I think there is that, that sort of element going on there, Nash 3000. Um, I am very jealous of people who saw the ham, you remain, shouted at Plov. I miss the theatre. No, I don't. I hate it. Um, but I wish I could have seen that. I really wish I could have seen that production. Um, hopefully we'll get some, maybe they'll, they'll screen it whilst we're all in lockdown at some stage. But until then. So I think I'm afraid that our time is, is very much up. Um, Thank you for, for being there, if you are there. That's a very Bacassian way of putting it. Uh, if you're here later, I hope you're here better. Um, that's another Bacassian way of putting it. Um, this is weird, um, but we'll have to get used to it, I suppose, for a bit. Um, and I hope to see some of you, many of you, in real life, whatever that might be, at a later date. So thank you all for your for your company and I I hope you 
delve into Beckett a little more. Thank you all very much and good evening.